Hello, I'll be reading from the works of Paramhansa Yogananda, the author of the autobiography of a yogi. Not only from the autobiography of a yogi, but I will also read from his books, Where There Is Light and In the Sanctuary of the Soul. These are very inspiring readings. I'll be starting from Years in My Master's Hermitage. This is a chapter from the autobiography of a yogi. And it is from the middle of the chapter after Paramahansa Yogananda has started living in the ashram with Sri Upeshwar, his guru. Paramahansa Yogananda writes in the middle of the chapter, my guru was a peerless interpreter of the scriptures. Many of my happiest memories were centered in his discourses. But his jewel thoughts were not cast into the ashes of boundlessness or stupidity, heedlessness or stupidity. One restless movement of my body or my slight lapse into absent-minded would suffice to put an abrupt period to master's exposition. You are not here. Sri Yukteswar interrupted himself one day with this observation. As usual, he was keeping relentless track of my attention. Guruji, my tone was a protest. I have not stirred. My eyelids have not moved. I can repeat each word you have uttered. Nevertheless, you were not fully with me. Your objection forces me to remark that in your mental background, you were creating three institutions. One was a sylvan retreat on a plain, another on a hilltop, still another by the ocean. Those vaguely formulated thoughts had indeed been present almost subconsciously. I glanced at him apologetically. What can I do with such a master, one who penetrates my random musing? You have given me that right. The subtle truths I am expounding cannot be grasped without your complete concentration. Unless necessary, I do not invade the seclusion of others' minds. Man has the natural privilege of roaming secretly among his thoughts. The unbidden Lord does not enter there. Neither do I venture intrusion. You are welcome, ever welcome, Master. Your architectural dreams will materialize later. Now is the time for study. Thus, incidentally, in his simple way, my guru revealed his knowledge of the coming of three important events in my life. Since early youth, I had had enigmatic glimpses of three buildings, each in a different setting. In the exact sequence Sri Yukteswar had indicated, these visions took ultimate form. First came my founding of a boys' yoga school on a plain in Ranchi, then an American headquarters on a Los Angeles hilltop, and then a hermitage in Encinitas, California, overlooking the vast Pacific. Master never arrogantly said, I prophesy that such and such event shall occur. He would rather hint, don't you think it may happen? But his simple speech hid Vatic power. There was no recanting. Never did his slightly veiled predictions prove false. Sri Yukteswar was reserved and matter of fact in demeanor. There was naught of the vague or daft visionary about him. His feet were firm on earth. His head in the haven of heaven. Practical people aroused his admiration. 
Saintliness is not dumbness. Divine perceptions are not incapacitating, he would say. The active expression of virtue gives rise to the keenest intelligence. My guru was reluctant to discuss the superphysical realms. His only marvelous aura was that of perfect simplicity. In conversation, he avoided startling references. In action, he was freely expressive. Many teachers talked of miracles but could manifest nothing. Sri Yukteswar seldom mentioned the subtle laws but secretly operated them at will. A man of realization does not perform any miracle until he receives an inward sanction, Master explained. God does not wish the secrets of his creation revealed promiscuously. Also, every individual in the world has an inalter, inalienable right to his free will. A saint will not encroach on that independence. The silence habitual to Sri Yukteswar was caused by his deep perceptions of the infinite. No time remained for the interminable revolutions that occupy the days of teachers without self-realization. A saying from the Hindu scriptures is, in shallow men, the fish of little thoughts cause much commotion. In oceanic minds, the whales of inspiration make hardly a ruffle. Because of my guru's unspectacular guise, only a few of his contemporaries recognized him as a superman. The adage, he is a fool that cannot conceal his wisdom, could never be applied to my profound and quiet master. Though born a mortal like all others, Sri Yukteswar achieved identity with the ruler of time and space. Master found no insuperable obstacle to the emergence of human and divine to the emergence of human and divine. No such barrier exists, I came to understand, save in man's spiritual unadventurousness. I always thrilled at the touch of Sri Yukteswar's holy feet. A disciple is spiritually magnetized by reverent contact with a master. A subtle current is generated. The devotee's undesirable habit mechanisms in the brain are often as if cauterized. The grooves of his worldly tendencies are beneficially disturbed. Momentarily, at least, he may find the secret veils of Maya lifting and glimpse the reality of bliss. My whole body responded with a liberating glow whenever I knelt in the Indian fashion before my guru. Even when Lehri Mahashe was silent, Master told me, or when he conversed on other than strictly religious topics, I discovered that nonetheless he had transmitted to me ineffable knowledge. Sri Yukteswar affected me similarly. If I entered the hermitage in a worried or indifferent frame of mind, my attitude imperceptibly changed. A healing calm descended at the mere sight of my guru. Each day with him was a new experience in joy, peace and wisdom. Never did I find him deluded or emotionally intoxicated with greed, anger, or human attachment. The darkness of Maya is silently approaching. Let us hie homeward within. With these cautionary words, Master constantly reminded his disciples of their need for Kriya Yoga. A new student occasionally expressed doubts regarding his own worthiness to engage 
in yoga practice. Forget the past, Sri Yukteswar would console him. The vanished lives of all men are dark with many shames. Human conduct is ever unreliable until man is anchored in the divine. Everything in future will improve if you are making a spiritual effort now. Beautiful words from the autobiography of a yogi. And now we will read from Where There Is Light. Let us delve into the chapter on strength in times of adversity, where there is light. Everything the Lord has created is to try us to bring out the buried soul immortality within us. That is the adventure of life, the one purpose of life. And everyone's adventure is different, unique. You should be prepared to deal with all problems of health, mind and soul by common sense, methods and faith in God, knowing that in life or death, your soul remains unconquered. Never let life beat you down. Beat life. If you have a strong will, you can overcome all difficulties. Affirm even in the midst of trials, Danger and I were born together, and I am more dangerous than danger. Danger and I were born together, and I am more dangerous than danger. Affirm this. This is a truth you should always remember. Apply it and you will see that it works. Don't behave like a cringing mortal being. You are a child of God. Many people are afraid of life's problems. I have never feared them, Paramansa Yogananda writes. For I have ever prayed, Lord, may thy power increase in me. Keep me in the positive consciousness that with thy help, I can always overcome my difficulties. Since you are made in God's image, to believe that your tests are more difficult than your divinity, is powerful to overcome them is to believe in an untruth. Remember, no matter what your tests are, you are not too weak to fight. God will not suffer you to be tempted more than you are able to bear. St. Francis had more troubles than you could imagine, but he didn't give up. One by one, by the power of the mind, he overcame these obstacles and became one with the master of the universe. Why shouldn't you have that kind of determination? Use every trial that comes to you as an opportunity to improve yourself. When you are passing through the difficulties and tests of life, you usually become rebellious. Why should this happen to me? Instead, you should think of every trial as a pickaxe with which to dig into the soul of your consciousness and release the fountain of spiritual strength that lies within it. Each test should bring out the hidden power that is within you as a child of God made in his image. To fly away from problems may seem the easiest solution, but you gain strength only when you wrestle with a strong opponent. One who doesn't have difficulties is one who doesn't grow. Life is worth nothing if it is not a continuous overcoming of problems. Each problem that waits for a solution at your hand is a religious duty imposed upon you by life itself. Any escape from problems, physical or mental, is an escape from life as there can be no life that is not full of problems. Meet everybody and every circumstance on the battle of life with the courage of a hero and the smile of a conqueror. When my trials become very great, 
I first seek understanding in myself. I don't blame circumstances or try to correct anybody else. I go inside first. I try to clean the citadel of my soul to remove anything that obstructs the soul's all-powerful, all-wise expression. That is the successful way to live. Trouble and disease have a lesson for us. Our painful experiences are not meant to destroy us, but to burn out our dross, to hurry us back home. No one is more anxious for our release than God. The smokescreen of delusion has come between us and God, and he is sorry that we have lost sight of him. He is not happy seeing his children suffer so much, dying from falling bombs, terrible diseases and wrong habits of living. He regrets it for he loves us and wants us back. If only you would make the effort at night to meditate and be with him. He thinks of you so much. You are not forsaken. It is you who have forsaken yourself. When you use life's experiences as your teacher and learn from them, the true nature of the world and your part in it, these experiences become valuable guides to eternal fulfillment and happiness. In a sense, misery is your best friend because it starts you seeking God. When you begin to see clearly the imperfection of the world, you will begin to seek the perfection of God. The truth is that God is using evil not to destroy us, but to make us disillusioned with his toys, with the playthings of the world, so that we might seek him. Gloom is but the shade of Divine Mother's hand, outstretched caressingly. Don't forget that. Sometimes when the mother is going to caress you, a shadow is caused by her hand before it touches you. So when trouble comes, don't think that she is punishing you. Her hand overshadowing your, you holds some blessing as it reaches out to bring you nearer to her. Suffering is a good teacher to those who are quick and willing to learn from it. But it becomes a tyrant to those who resist and resent. Suffering can teach us almost everything. Its lessons urge us to develop discrimination, self-control, non-attachment, morality, and transcendent spiritual consciousness. For example, a stomachache tells us not to eat too much and to watch what we eat. The pain from loss of possessions or loved ones reminds us of the temporal nature of all things in this world of delusion. The consequences of wrong actions impel us to exercise discrimination. Why not learn through wisdom? Then you won't subject yourself to unnecessary painful discipline from the hard taskmaster of suffering. Suffering is caused by the misuse of free will. God has given us the power to accept him or reject him. He doesn't want us to encounter woes but will not interfere when we choose actions that lead to misery. All the causes of ill health or sudden financial failure or other troubles that come upon you without warning and without you knowing why were created by you in the past, in this or in previous incarnations and have been silently germinating in your consciousness. Don't blame God or anyone else if you are suffering from disease financial problems, emotional upsets. You created the cause of the problem in the past and must make a greater determination to uproot it now. Too many people misinterpret the meaning of karma, adopting a fatalistic attitude. You do not have to accept karma. If I tell you that somebody is standing behind you, ready to hurt you because you once hit him and you meekly say, well, it is my karma, and wait for him to strike you, of course you will get a blow. Why don't you try to mollify him?
By pacifying him, you may lessen his bitterness and remove his desire to strike you. The effects of your actions have much less power to hurt you when you do not allow the mind to give in to them. Remember that. You can also resist by counteracting the bad effects of past wrong actions with good effects set in motion by present right actions, thus preventing the creation of an environment favorable to the fruition of your bad karma. I'll be reading now from In the Sanctuary of the Soul, which is a guide to effective prayer by Paramahansa Yogananda. Enter the quietness of your soul. The temple of God is within your soul. Enter into this quietness and sit there in meditation with the light of intuition burning on the altar. There is no restlessness, no searching or striving there. Come into the silence of solitude. Enter the innermost sanctuary of the soul. Remember and realize the forgotten image of God within you. Each of us is a child of God. We are born of his spirit in all its purity and glory and joy. The heritage is unassailable, the Bible says. That heritage is unassailable, the Bible says. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Always remember your Father loves you unconditionally. We need not run away to the jungle to seek Him. We can find Him in this jungle of daily life in the cave of inner silence. Even if you do no more than pray sincerely to him, his great joy will eventually come upon you. True prayer is an expression of the soul, an urge from the soul. It is a hunger for God that arises from within, expressing itself to him ardently, silently. Constantly, inwardly talk to him, then he cannot remain away from you. The Lord is the mother of all mothers, the father of all fathers, the one friend behind all friends. If you always think of him as the nearest of the near, you will witness many wonders in your life. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. These were readings from the writings of Paramhansa Yogananda, author of the autobiography of a yogi and many other collections of his writings. They are all so inspiring. Let us be inspired today and forever.